Last week, Pastor Chris brought us a great message around fatherhood, and we thank you. It was excellent. This morning, we're returning to our summer series in the book of Matthew. And so I want to stop before I get rolling here, and I want to pray. And so, Lord, um, we come before you. We continue our worship, and we worship in your word. So as we open your word, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will do what only he can do. That he will take his word and move and, and just plant it, Lord, firmly in our minds and in our hearts so that your transforming work takes place in our lives and we are changed. And the sons and daughters of God said together, amen. Well, today's message is around the authority of the king. Thirty years ago, Georgetta and I were members at College Hill Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, some have called the Presbyterians God's frozen chosen, but I want to promise you at College Hill that was not true. The, all of the staff, uh, and it was a large congregation, all of the staff were spirit-filled, and most of the congregation were spirit-filled, although not all, and one of the amazing things that happened in that congregation is everybody dwelt together in harmony. That was a, a most interesting time in our lives. Dr. Jerry Kirk was our senior pastor, and the Lord had placed on Jerry's heart this whole issue of pornography. It's a real blight on the land. Many have struggled with it, and it tears down. It certainly doesn't build up. And so he formed an organization called NCAP, the National Coalition Against Pornography. At the same time, the Reagan administration was forming a, a movement themselves to address this whole issue of pornography. Imagine that if you can. Um, you know, uh, politicians moving to try to take a blight out of the nation. But in that meeting room, that day, in the Oval Office that Jerry Kirk attended, were people of great authority. President Ronald Reagan, Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush, Attorney General Edwin Meese, and a whole who's who in the Christian world were all there, all present. And so when Jerry got back to Cincinnati, he couldn't wait to tell his wife, Patty, about this. He couldn't wait to tell her how many important people were in that room. And when he was telling her, she said, one less than you think. Let that sink in for a moment. There were lots of important people in the room, and his wife says to him, one less than you think. Well, Jerry understood authority. He was a man with authority, and he was a man under authority. And that's what we're going to look at today together. Two weeks ago, Pastor Charlie gave us a message out on the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually, Matthew gives three chapters, five through seven, on the Sermon on the Mount. It's that important. It's the longest sermon we have of Jesus' ministry. In his great sermon, Jesus established his authority as the one who fulfills both the law and the prophets, the promised, the long-awaited Messiah. He did this by teaching with an authority that was different than the teachers of the law. They taught with an authority around the written word. He taught with an authority that came from within himself. Jesus spoke, and he spoke to radical obedience at the end of his message, radical obedience to his word, declaring those wise who practice it and foolish who do not. The crowd was amazed at his teaching, and while they didn't fully understand his identity, they recognized real authority in his message. The message carried the authority of God. Today we will explore the next revelation Matthew gives us as he displays Jesus' authority by his actions. Matthew moves us from the authority of Jesus declared in the Sermon on the Mount to the authority of Jesus demonstrated through his miracles. The words of Jesus are powerful. They have the authority of God, but as often has been said, actions speak louder than words. It's certainly true to us. 
So today's message looks at the authority of the king revealed through his miraculous actions, which are evidence both of his authority and his divinity. The Sermon on the Mount declared his authority. The miracles displayed his authority. Matthew's gospel was written to the Jewish people. It was written so that they would understand that Jesus truly was this long-promised Messiah and also the Son of God. Matthew uses, here's a good theology term for you, pericopes. A pericope is a small story within a larger story. Matthew, in this section of Scripture, uses a number of them to prove his point. Only God could do what Jesus did. And therefore, Jesus is to be worshipped as the one who has all the authority of God. Matthew is not writing his gospel in chronological order. He's arranged it thematically. The miracles that we're going to look at may have happened at any time during Jesus' ministry. He's put them together for purpose. Each of the pericopes gives us insight into the authority of Jesus over various aspects of his creation. So as we go through these small stories, we will look at them through the window of three questions. First, what is real authority? Second, what does it mean to be under authority? And third, how is my life reflecting the authority of Jesus? So if you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew 8. We're going to be moving through Matthew 8 in the first part of Matthew 9. What is authority? Nelson's Bible Dictionary defines authority as the power or right to give orders and then see that they are followed. The Greek word we translate authority is exousia. It not only means authority, it carries the connotation of power with it. There's two basic forms of authority. The first type of authority is intrinsic, that which comes from within this is a specific authority of God alone. It's authority that covers all areas of life, all areas of his creation. In forgiving the sins of the paralyzed man, Jesus exercises intrinsic authority. All sin is against God, and only God can forgive sin. Isaiah 43, 25 declares this. This is God speaking. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Forgiveness comes from God alone. In forgiving sins, Jesus shows his divinity and his absolute authority over all things. The second type of authority is derived authority. It's authority granted to specific people for specific purposes in specific times. For example, God gives authority to people to govern. Paul says in Romans 13, 1, there is no authority except by God. So if we are troubled by whomever is in authority, one of the things we have to do is step back and recognize it's God who put that person there. Many wrestled when Obama was president of the United States. Many wrestle when Trump is now president of the United States. And the point to us as followers of Jesus is his authority was given to each. And therefore, we are to come under his authority. Today, we will examine the authority of Jesus' actions and see what they show us about his identity and also how people reacted to it. We're going to look at authority over disease. We're going to look at authority over demonic beings. We're going to look at authority over nature. We're going to look at authority that was recognized, authority that was declared, and authority that was dismissed. The first pericope in chapter 8 is that of a leper seeking healing for his disease. Clearly, he's heard about Jesus and his ability to heal people, and he finds his way to Jesus amidst a large crowd. He begins by kneeling before Jesus. That word we translate kneeling could be translated worshiped. He came and he first worships at the feet of Jesus. It's an act of yielding himself. 
And he follows it with a simple confession. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. No one else in the crowd would have touched the leper. First, it would have made them ceremonially unclean, but it's a very contagious disease. There was no healing from it. Lepers were outcasts in the Jewish community, but when Jesus touches and heals the man, he is not made unclean by touching the leper. The leper is made clean by his touch, the touch of the king. Disease came into the world as a result of sin. It's part of the curse. But in healing those in need, Jesus is reversing the curse for them. It is a picture of what the kingdom of heaven will be like in its future fullness. There's four other examples in this section of Scripture in Matthew on the authority of Jesus over disease. The first is in 8.13 where Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Jesus doesn't even go to the centurion's house. In fact, the centurion tells him, you don't need to come to my house. Jesus is amazed and in the end says to him, go, it will be done just as you believed it would and the servant was healed just as the king had declared. The second is in 8, 14, and 15 where he healed Peter's mother of a fever, this time by touching her. Her healing was immediate and she got up and she began to serve the king. The third is in 816. There was a large crowd around Jesus, and they had brought many who were sick. And what Matthew tells us is he healed all of them. The fourth is in chapter 9, verses 2 through 7, where Jesus heals the paralyzed man. And what he says to him directly is, go, get up, take your mat, and go home. These healings are each miraculous, each different from the other. One spoken at a distance, one by touching, one by speaking directly to the man. There's no formula here. Each is unique. Each uniquely shows his authority. The centurion's faith was strong. He only needed Jesus to speak the word. But listen, the leper was an untouchable, and he needed the touch of the king. Matthew connects Jesus with the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah predicting 400 years before Messiah, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases the Messiah would be the Davidic king that everybody expected, but they had long forgotten he would also be the suffering servant. The healings during his earthly ministry can be understood in terms both of his compassion and the laying the foundation for the coming kingdom of God. Because sin brought about disease, healing and wholeness as well as eternal life were paid for at the cross they were paid for by his atoning sacrifice. These will all be fully manifested in the future kingdom of God. The second thing Matthew walks us through is Jesus' authority over demons. Our culture generally refuses to believe in the divine supernatural, although there's all kinds of undivine supernatural out there. Demons are outside the realm of our natural world, and they are therefore dismissed by many in the modern era. But Matthew pushes us to understand that there is more to this world than what we can see and what we can understand through either science or rational thinking. Jesus discerns first and confronts demonic forces and shows his authority over them. In 8.16, Matthew records many, many who were demon-possessed, just like many who were sick. Many were brought to him who were demon-possessed, and he drove out the spirits with what? A word. A word. The author of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and powerful, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is, of, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Jesus discerned between illness and demonic possession, and the words he spoke would heal or deliver all who were possessed. The second pericope on demonic possession is in verses 28 through 34. Here Jesus is on the far side of the Sea of Galilee and comes across two demon-possessed men who were feared greatly by all around them. They recognize Jesus, these demons. They recognize him as the Son of God and call him that and know that it's not yet their appointed time. When they said appointed time, there is a time out there where Jesus will send them into eternal punishment. That time was not yet. And so they, they ask him, send us into this herd of pigs. And he does. And the pigs run down the side of the hill into the lake and drown. Even these are spiritual beings, but they are in no way equal to Jesus. They recognize Jesus, they recognize his authority, and they're subject to it. The third area that Matthew takes us through is authority over nature. The creator of heaven and earth displays his authority in this realm, Jesus is actually asleep in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. He's with his disciples, and a violent storm arises. If you've been there, you know that weather systems coming up to the Sea of Galilee can come up very quickly and force very violent kinds of storms. That's what happened. His, his disciples were fearful. They cry out. They wake him up. Lord, save us. We're going to drown his response is classic. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? They did have some faith. They knew if they woke him up, he could do something about the problem. What they lacked was faith to see that the mission of the king couldn't be ended by a storm. There's a real lesson in this for all of us. It's not a harsh reprimand on his part. It's a reminder to them that until God's purpose in their lives is completed, death had no power over them. It had no power over Jesus, and it had no power over them until God's purpose was fulfilled. The same is true for each of us. Even the disciples didn't understand who Jesus really was at this time. Their response is, frankly, one of amazement. Just like the crowds after the Sermon on the Mount, they ask, who is this man? And then here they add, even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus is in the process of revealing himself to his disciples. Who but God alone commands nature, and it obeys. Then we want to move to authority recognized. We've already seen that the centurion's servant was healed by Jesus, but that's not all of his story. The centurion, it tells us, recognized authority because he was a man himself under authority, and he had men under him, so he was in a position of authority. A centurion in the Roman army was a tough combat veteran. They were more like top sergeants in the United States Army today. They were commanders of a hundred, but these were the professional soldiers, the backbone of the Roman army. They were tough men, hard-bitten men, men with lots of combat experience. And yet this, this centurion, says to Jesus, I know authority, and you've got it. When Jesus sees the faith of the centurion, he declares that he's seen no greater faith in all of Israel 
than he's seen in this Gentile warrior. Then Jesus contrasts the Jewish people, especially their leaders, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, with this warrior, the centurion. He says the centurion will sit one day with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the great feast of God. And then he says, and many, many in the Jewish race, those to whom all of these promises were initially given, will be outside. God isn't interested in how religious we can act. He wants those to know him. He wants those who come to him to trust him. And it is they who will inherit the kingdom of God. Similarly, Jesus taught that there's a cost for following him in verses 18 through 22. The teacher of the law who's with him says, I'll go wherever you go. Jesus reminds him there's not going to be an earthly benefit here for him. And while we don't really know what the man's ultimate decision was, Many who are looking for an earthly reward in following Jesus will be disappointed. This was the problem with the name it and claim it movement in recent history. Trying to get something for ourselves. There's a price to be paid for following Jesus. A disciple who was already following him asked Jesus to allow him to go and bury his father before he continues. Jesus' response here is very harsh. He says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. I've read a number of commentaries. Many have tried to interpret this as a man who wanted his inheritance first. So he was saying to the Lord, let me go get my inheritance and then I'll come back. There's nothing in the scripture that would lead us to say that. I think what's primarily happening here is various commentaries are trying to excuse the harsh language Jesus is using. But perhaps Jesus is further defining himself as the absolute priority for his followers. Perhaps Jesus detected within this man an insincere heart who wanted to accept Jesus on his terms, and Jesus let him know that was not good enough. D.A. Carson says, even the closest family ties must not be set above allegiance to Jesus and the proclamation of the kingdom. Commitment to Jesus must be without reservation, such as the importance Jesus himself attached to his own person and mission. Yes, this is a hard saying, but it addresses our second question, what does it mean to be under the authority of Jesus? Finally, we want to look at authority declared and dismissed. Matthew 9.8 concludes this section of Scripture. Matthew preceded this section with the crowds declaring the authority of Jesus as a teacher unlike any other. He ends this section of Scripture with this when the crowd saw this, the paralyzed man healed, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Like his disciples, the crowd didn't fully understand who Jesus was, but they certainly recognized his authority, and they declared it. Matthew has taken us from the authority declared to authority demonstrated. But the people in the region of the Gadarenes where Jesus healed the demoniacs pleaded with him to leave. This is authority dismissed. What does it tell us about them? Were they more concerned about their loss of wealth than understanding who it was that was among them? They had paid a cost in property. Maybe they were unwilling to lose more. Many see Jesus this way afraid of what following him will cost. This is what he calls us to remember. Jesus gave up everything for us, everything. His requirement to follow him unconditionally is not unreasonable. And it leads us to our third question. 
How am I responding to his authority? In Mark 10, 29 through 31, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields, fields are possessions, for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Yes, there's a cost to following Jesus, but there's a great reward in knowing him as well, both in this life and in his kingdom. So here are some questions. As a teacher, it's always the teacher that answers and asks the questions first. Do I want Jesus above everything else? Or do I want other things which are more important to me plus Jesus? Or do I want Jesus to leave me alone? Each of us will answer the questions. If there's a cost to following Jesus, there's a cost to choosing not to follow him. The cost includes not realizing your true purpose in life. God had a plan for each of our lives before the creation of the universe. And if we choose not to follow Jesus, we will have missed what God had planned for us. There's a cost of refusing to follow Jesus. It's eternal separation from God. Dear ones, there's no living with a foot in two kingdoms. I've tried. It doesn't work. We're either in the kingdom of God or we're in the kingdom of this world. We are either under the authority of Jesus or we're under the prince of this world's authority. Like it or not, it's a binary choice. And it's a choice that has to be reaffirmed Sometimes day by day, sometimes multiple times in a day, but always on a regular basis. Matthew ends his gospel this way. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them. This is after his resurrection. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's repeating what we studied earlier. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, here's his promise, I am with you always to the very end of the age. How do we respond to the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth and then calls us to follow him, to participate in his mission to seek and save the lost? Our response is really two things this morning. I'm going to share four areas of response with you and then we're going to respond at the table of the Lord. First, I believe he says to follow him with loving obedience. Loving obedience. This is not duty. I grew up in a house of duty. I understand duty. I was in the military. I understand duty. That's not what Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to loving obedience that acknowledges his authority over everything in our lives. Every one of us has to look. Is there an area? or areas of your life that you've withheld from his authority. He's not standing back with a two-by-four waiting to whack you for it. It is the Holy Spirit moving within you that wants you to understand that this is an area now I want to deal with in your life. I want to bring it under the authority of the king. Second, I believe we follow him with gratitude acknowledges his great sacrifice for us. It still boggles my mind that the King of Kings 
would come and lay down his life for me who deserved none of it. And he did the same for you. And so we follow him with gratitude, acknowledging his great sacrifice. He did for us what we could never have done for ourselves to bring us back to the love of the Father. Third, we follow him without conditions, without conditions. The transformative life of the Christian is both learning and practicing how to die to self. Self is that old sinful nature. It's not who we are anymore, but it certainly seems to raise its head often enough. And so he calls us to follow him without conditions, not keeping areas of our lives apart from his authority. And fourth, he calls us to follow him with joy. Joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is based in circumstance. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And so we follow him with joy, knowing he is our greatest reward. This is what he said to Abraham all the way back in Genesis. Abraham, I am your greatest reward. And this is what Jesus says to each one of us. I am your reward. I have come to give you life and that abundantly. This morning, we're going to come to his table. Imagine a king having people who despised him, hated him, killed him, ignored him, who he lays down his life for says, come follow me. And then in his compassion, he says, come sit at my table. Come. So this morning, we're going to serve communion by intincture. It's an ancient method. There'll be people in the corners and here. You'll come when you're finished praying and you're ready. You'll come. And you'll take a piece of the bread and you'll dip it into the cup and you'll receive the body and blood of Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he said to his disciples, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. If you're his follower, you are his disciple. And he says, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. After the supper, in a similar manner, he took the cup. This was probably the third cup of the Passover service. It's called the cup of redemption. How appropriate. And he said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've heard your word. Lord, we trust that your spirit will take your word, not only put it in our minds, but put it in our hearts so that your spirit can take it and begin to change who we are from the inside out. Lord, this morning, each of us looks into our life, and Lord, we bring to you, we confess those things where we have not allowed your authority over us. Lord, we come to your table. We come humbly. We come gratefully. And Lord, we come with great joy. For you have done great things. And the people of God said together, Amen. When you are finished, you pray yourselves. Come to one of these stations and receive the body and blood of Christ. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. 
In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus, the earth is loving. 
cease to be amazed when I come to his table. I hope you never cease to be amazed when you come to his table. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, and grant you peace. When you're rising up and you're lying down, and you're going out and you're coming in, both now and forever more. Amen.